and we're live. So we just got a couple of minutes before we start. Just wanted to check everything was up and running. Microphone was working. We'll wait till six o'clock and then we'll get started in case anyone's watching at the moment. Getting set up, ready to go. We'll be started another minute or two. Facebook Live. We'll wait a couple of minutes, and then we'll get started. Talking about breast surgery tonight, so any questions you've got, feel free to let me know. Type them up. And I'll try and answer it as many as possible. So we are live with Facebook Live. My name's Philip Richardson. A couple of minutes before everyone joins us, but I just wanted to get started and underway. I'm talking about all breast surgery tonight, so feel free to ask me any questions that you have um, regarding breast surgeries, but specifically about um, breast implant surgery, primary surgery, secondary surgery, and also about Motiva implants, which is an implant which I've used now for a few years. It's been used all around the world uh, for, for nine or so years, and there's been some great results both in my practice and around the world with Motiva implants. So we'll be talking about Motiva implants and why I like them and uh, what makes them different and perhaps where the future, future of breast implants is. So if you've got any questions related to any of this, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, there'll be people joining us at various times, so um, please don't hesitate to let me know. We've had some uh, questions already that have been sent in beforehand and I'll get to those in a second. But mainly I'll be talking about Motiva implants. So if anyone's got any questions, don't hesitate to let me know. As I said, at Brisbane Plastic Surgery, my name is Dr. Philip Richardson, I'm a plastic surgeon in Brisbane. I've been in practice for about 17 years and I used to be in the valley and about three years ago, I've moved out into Racecourse Road, Hamilton, with some nice rooms. Um, so in terms of previous questions that we've been asked, um, first, implant, first question is, um, with respect to motive implants, why should we choose them? And um, are they naturally feeling? Well, motive implants, as I said, have been around for about nine, years uh, overseas and a lot of the top surgical centres around the world are now using them. They've been in this country for two years and so far the results have been good. They look exactly like that and they have a nano surface on the outside that feels like silk but they're classified as a smooth implant and that's important because it it's the smooth implants that, as far as we know, have never been associated with a very low-grade malignancy called lymphoma, or ALCL. And it seems that all of the smooth implants um, don't predispose to that tumour compared to the textured implants, which are a rougher implant like that, or a polyurethane implant like that, or a Brazilian implant. And these, two implants, uh, tend to be the ones associated with ALCL. So 
or that lymphoma. So this is a very important breakthrough of this surface. It's a type of smooth surface, but specifically designed to reduce the risk of capsule contraction. The rate of capsule contraction is hard to assess because it's a long-term problem, but so far the rates have been very low associated with this nanotechnology. In addition to that, the particular type of gel on the outside of these implants is very important in terms of reducing the rate of capsule contraction, which is the long-term scarring that can form around breast implants. The scarring, again, is a long-term risk. It's one of the long-term reasons that implants need to be changed. And um, the capsule contracture is reduced uh, by the nanotechnology, but the rupture is reduced by having a gel that's quite cohesive and a shell that's continuous with the gel inside. So it's very resistant to rupture. And you can see that you can almost do what you like with these implants and they're not gonna have any, any problems. They come in two types. The first type is a more uh, natural type, which sits inside like that, underneath the breast mus muscle. And what that does is it has a very natural sort of shape. And their, their second type, which is a round or progressive gel, sits a little bit faker inside. So it gives you a little bit more upper pole fullness. So it comes in the two types. But both of them have very low um, long-term risks, feel very soft and natural, and um, don't predispose to the ALCL, that condition, um, which can occur with the textured or, or, or polyurethane implants. Um, next question is, um, do I use them on all patients? And whilst, whilst mostly I use Motiva implants, there are occasions when other implants, other smooth implants are indicated. And even sometimes a textured implant in a particular person might be indicated. But most of the time I use a Motiva implant because of their low risk and the fact that they feel so soft, natural, and have long-term very low complications. Um, other questions I've been asked are um, if you're a very thin person, what would you do differently? And in a thin person, I think a breast implant looks, uh, looks bigger because you're, you're thinner and so you don't want to go too big. Um, stick to the size that the doctor, your plastic surgeon recommends. Um, also you want an implant that doesn't go outside the boundaries of the breast space. So the breast space is the width of the breast and if you go too wide then you're more likely to have rippling and other problems associated with being thin. Um, keep in mind when you're very thin that if you go too big, everyone's going to know you've got an implant. So if you want to be, have a very natural result that people can hardly tell, you need to go uh, a very moderate profile, not to go too big of implant. Um, patient asked me about long torso. In a, in a long torso patient, that uh, person, that just means a long distance between your waist up to your breasts. It really depends on the position of the nipple and the position of the fold as to where the implant is positioned um, and what type of implant. But in general, if the, if the fold can be lowered and the nipple position is pretty good, then a standard implant, uh, Motiva implant is indicated. And um, I like to use an ergonomics implant to, to really push out that lower pole and, um, and go from there. There's another question, what's the largest size available? Implants go up to about a, a thousand cc's or a litre and they can be made custom at a larger size as well. It's very rare for us to go up to that size. In fact, it's very rare for me to go more than about 550, 600 mils. And the reason for that is that if you go too big, then you've got the full weight of the implants sitting down and, um, and they're going to drag your breast down in time. The other thing is they thin your breast tissue, so you're more likely to see any rippling down the track. It's hard to find bras that fit big breast implants. Um, it's harder for exercise, and they can just be uncomfortable. And even, even though they're usually under the muscle, it can have weight on your shoulders as well. So for all those reasons, big breast implants 
generally have a higher complication rate and a reduced safety. So it's not my preference to use implants that are more than about 550 or 600 mils in size, even though you can go to a litre in size if you really, really wanted to. Now we've got some other questions coming in. Uh, we've got a question about tuberous breast, where there's asymmetry of breast tissue. So what I like to do in tuberous breast is get both breasts the same shape and size with their normal natural tissue, and then, and, and it can be at the same time, but then once the breasts are as close as possible to each other, then an implant's put in that's as close as possible to each other as well. And that way, in the long term, both of the implants act the same way. So if you just put an um, implant in the small breast, then that would always stay up nice and high, and in time, the big natural breast would drop down low. And that's not what you want in time. So if they're both about the same amount of breast tissue, and if they're both about the same implant size, then in the long term, they're going to naturally drop and sit in the same way. And long term, they're going to look very symmetrical. So that's key to asymmetry and uh, patients with an asymmetric um, preoperative shape and size. So the next question is, can you get two different size implants if you need to, or do they come in pairs? Good question. Um, I commonly use two different size implants. Almost everyone has some asymmetry in the size of their breasts. For example, if there's a patient um, and I'll assess them both clinically and with the Vectra computer machine, which we have here, if there's a difference of 30 or 40 mils between them, which is the most common difference between implants, then uh, between breasts, then I'll use implants that are 30 or 40 mils different. Probably about a third of my patients would have two different size implants, so they don't come in pairs. They, they uh, are very uh, individual and um, but if there's a really big difference in breast, then it's better to reduce the big one first and then go for a similar size implant. Uh, next question is how far over the BWD can you safely go or is it the way a surgeon puts the implant into the pockets and the way the surgeon places the implant? So BWD is breast width uh, or diameter and Essentially, if you go outside the limits of a patient's breast width, then the risks that you uh, take as a surgeon and as a patient is that the implants can lift up in the middle, a condition called symastia or uniboot, or they can stick too far out the side and you need to get too much side boob. And so it really is for safety reasons that the width of an implant fits the width of the breast and the risks of going outside that are quite significant. Also, if the implant pocket is made too much towards the middle um, and you expose just literally skin and a bit of subcutaneous tissue over the top of the implant, you're a lot more likely to have rippling and, um, and out the side you can often get rippling as well if you go for too far out the side. So there's a few different reasons you want to stay, stay to the breast width diameter that you've got. And the average width, which we measure with this machine, which is this little uh, apparatus, is 12 centimetres. And a narrow patient is usually about 11 centimetres and a wide patient is about 13 centimetres. So we then would pick an implant that's nice and wide like that for a wide patient or a very narrow implant for someone who's just got a narrow uh, breast diameter. So it depends on your diameter to the width of your implant. Um, there's a question about whether Motiva implants are safer and if they are safer, how, why are they safer? Well, safety is an interesting uh, concept because Safety takes a long time to actually uh, be, be true. And there are some implants that have been around for a long time and then have had problems down the track. But in, as a general rule, the Motiva, Motiva implants so far in the first nine years or so have shown themselves to be very safe from a long-term complication rate and from a short-term problem, uh, short problems. Short-term problems can include 
uh, implant slip and malposition, implant mobility, and uh, they've got very low rates of that. Long term, very low rates of capsular contraction and rupture, and for that reason, I think they're as safe or safer. In addition, because of the smooth surface, they have um, not got not ever been seen to be associated with the ALCL, which is the lymphoma that can develop long term around an implant. So, uh, for all those reasons, Motiva implants are as safe an implant as we have on the market at the moment. Um, Laura says she has a base width diameter of 11.9. That's very average. So um, for a base width of, of 11.9, um, there are a range of implants that would fit that uh, width. And the most important thing is not to go over it. You can go under it. The problem with going under it if you've got a wide gap in the middle is that your gap will be a bit wider. But if you go wider than the 11.9, width diameter, then your implants can touch in the middle or the skin can lift up, particularly when you have um, larger, larger implants. There's a real risk of that. Now, other questions about whether to go on the muscle or under the muscle. Um, most of the time I would favour going under the muscle. And the reason for that is that it has long-term a lower capsular contracture rate and it has more cover over the top of the implants, so they look a little bit more natural. And then in the short to medium and long term, the muscle holds the implant to some extent, so that the force of gravity on the implant is less, and it's less likely to bottom out or drop out, and that, or droop in time. So if, you have a pa if I have a patient who has very loose skin, and I went on top of the muscle, very quickly that would weigh the skin and press down. But if I go under the muscle, the muscle will hold that to some extent and um, there'll be less drop of the, of the breast. So there's some of the reasons I prefer to go under the muscle. The classic example of on top of the muscle, when I'd go on top of the muscle, is when a patient has what's called tuberous breast, where they have a very constricted lower pole, or a very tight lower pole to their breast. And if you put an implant under the muscle, then there's a very high risk that um, you'll have what's called a double bubble, where underneath the breast, you get the old fold and then the new fold. So there's two folds, that's why it's called a double bubble. And that's more common in a condition such as tuberous breast. Um, and in those cases, often we go on top of the muscle. There is a, a, a plane called dual plane, and instead of the muscle covering all of that, uh, we release the, the muscle, the implant still stays under the muscle, but I release the muscle so it slides up a bit. And what you can see then is it pushes on the top of the implant, and then the implant can push on the lower part of the breast. And if you've got a tight lower pole uh, or you've got a short distance between the nipple and the fold, it will open up that lower pole of the breast, which is what you want. You want a nice breast with a nice round lower pole, not just a short, sharp lower pole with all the implant above there. So dual plane allows you to do that while still staying uh, under the muscle, and there's various degrees of um, under the muscle, uh, dual, dual plane, but most of the time it's just so that the muscle's covering the top, and that full gel, cohesive gel at the bottom can push out the lower pole of the breast. Another question I've been asked is about expanders. And if, if you're going from a very small size to a big size, it's very rare to use a tissue expander. A tissue expander is just a balloon that goes in the first stage, which you blow up with salt water or air, and it allows the skin to stretch prior to putting an implant in place. It is very rare these days for that to occur. And as long as you're staying within a reasonable range of breast implant, most patients can have that straight off of course, there is a very small risk of um, stretch marks. If you use bio oil for two weeks before, then that will reduce the risk of stretch marks occurring. Next question is about stretch marks. So stretch marks from, from my um, breast from weight loss, will they stretch more or be really visible after implants? Well, if you don't need a lift and you've just got stretch marks on your breast, 
if you if they've gone white and that means that they've been around for about a year or so so they've had time to fade because they're a scar like any other um, scar then if you put pressure on your stretch stretch marks if you hold your skin and hold them out then that's the appearance that your stretch marks will look like after you have this uh, after have a breast augmentation so it just puts them on the stretch they're always still there but it can flatten them out a little bit Christy says hi that's nice Trish Hammond said hello. Now, Laura says, why does bottoming out happen? So bottoming out is when the implant drops too low. Every time we do a breast implant in, through any approach, the natural ligament where the bottom of the breast called the inframammary fold attaches to the rib, there's a ligament in there, uh, then that ligament which is called the inframammary fold, is always to some extent interrupted during a breast augmentation. So just by cutting through the skin there or placing an implant in will disturb that natural ligament. If that ligament is not reconstructed at the end of the breast augmentation, particularly if the fold is lowered, then the implant will drop. And there's actually nothing much stopping it dropping there's no way of controlling how far it's going to drop, and that's called bottoming out. Usually associated with not fixing the fold as, as well as, um, as you could. And in fact, when I started 18 years ago in breast augmentation surgery, we, there was no such thing as fixing the fold. We, we put the implant in and we just allowed for the fact that it would drop a centimetre or two. But these days we fix the fold so the implant doesn't bottom out. If it does bottom out, um, and it can be just bad luck. It's not necessarily uh, because it wasn't reconstructed properly or anything. It can be just bad luck. If it does bottom out, then the treatment is to bring the implant back up surgically and to reconstruct that fold again using um, the tissue, the fibrous tissue in that area to lock the fold into the, uh, into the rib. And that usually fixes the bottoming out. Um, next question is, Kirsten says she ended up with semastia. Two repairs in, they still look terrible. They have major scars. Best advice, help the scar to help the scars heal. But if you have semastia, normally the treatment for semastia, which is the breast being too close together, would be to reduce the size of the implant so there's less pressure on the central um, sternal area. To uh, change the pocket, so if you're on top of the muscle, you might go under the muscle. If you're under the muscle, you might go back on top of the muscle, or at least what we call a neo-submuscular pocket, so a new pocket under the muscle. So change your pocket, uh, smaller implants if possible, and then the, the pocket is usually sewn in, so that as uh, sewn down onto the ribs, so that the skin can't lift up and that's from the inside so there's no scars on the outside so the outside scar should be just the original scar that's underneath the breast fold um, best way to treat scars is to i find use tape micropore tape for six weeks and then i use uh, bio oil for another six weeks and then i use some form of scar gel usually particularly if there's a problem but if there's no problem the scars will probably get better anyway but if they're a concern, then we'll use scar gel that you can rub in or scar gel strips. The rubbing in is easier, but the strips uh, work a bit better because they put a little bit of pressure on the scar as well. So if you're having trouble with scarring, they will be pink for three months and better over a full year. But if they're not getting better during that year, my best advice is, apart from seeing a plastic surgeon, my best advice is to uh, use some scar gel tape. Next question, Amber says, what happens if you get muscle repair with tummy tuck and you fall pregnant again? Good question, Amber, because the, the muscle is repaired using a non-dissolving uh, suture and that is designed to hold those muscles together um, and not become separated. Having said that, I've had two patients that have had pregnancies and babies after they've had tummy tuck and they had no problems at all. So what happens is, Instead of the muscles coming apart, they, they just stretch further out and you stretch more out the sides and less out the front. So everyone think, might think you're having a boy and you're really having a girl. Um, but 
you get less stretch at the front and more on the side. So you can, it's not ideal. If you think you might get pregnant again, it's probably better to uh, not have the muscle repaired. But if it accidentally happens down the track, it's, it's fine. My experience has been that there's been no issues. There's no need to take the sutures out. And interestingly enough, it, the repairs have held together and afterwards it's all been nice and flat again. So, um, but good question. Um, yeah, we reduce the size. All right, other questions. Um, how long does it take for breasts to drop, uh, properly drop and fluff? Some people uh, describe as fluffing and dropping that occurs over the first six weeks to three months um, as, as, as normal, and it is normal. It varies to the extent that it will happen. It depends on how high the implant is to start with and how much mu muscle spasm there is and the pocket size that was created. But generally by three months, most breasts have dropped and fluffed. As they drop down, they also become closer together, uh, which is interesting. And so the appearance of the breast improves over that entire period of time. Um, and at the end of the day, what we're hoping for is that about 45% of the breast volume is above the nipple and about 55% of the breast volume is below the nipple. And that takes up to three months to occur. If it's very slow to occur, I'll often recommend a bra brand, band that is worn across the top, straight around, around the body, and that puts pre pressure, it's like that, and it puts pressure on the top part of the uh, breast and it pushes the implants down. And in, in addition to that, I would normally get patients to massage um, the top part of their breast, massage the implant down for five minutes twice a day, and also in for five minutes twice a day, really to maximise that pocket so it's got every chance to drop and fluff. Um, one of the questions here was, if after three months they're still sitting too high, is there any possibility that they're gonna drop? It really depends how, how firm they are and how mobile the implants are. Um, but essentially, there will be less droop, uh, dro drop of the implants after three months. And so if there's a lot of, if it's way too high, then I think it's best talking at plastic surgeon about whether it's best waiting or perhaps even intervening earlier. But if it's only a little bit too high, um, then there's, with confidence, you can say there still will be some dropping of, of, the, of the breast implant. So most of it will occur in the first three months, but if it's a little bit slow, it will occur after that. Yeah. Some doctors say don't massage, but it makes sense. Uh, if implants, Tricia, are in the exactly in the right position from day one or day or week week one, then I don't get patients to massage. There's no need to massage. They will, uh, there's no long-term benefit with the massage. It doesn't make them softer or anything like that. Um, but the reason I massage them is to massage them into position because all implants can be moved a little bit with massage. And particularly if they're too high uh, or too far apart, I'm a big believer that massage starting at about week two or three when you can uh, do it without too much pain is definitely worth it. Um, but after about three months or so, you probably get less benefit from doing that. Now, Amber says, if your breasts aren't as close together as you like them, can you get a lift and implants to create a closer cleavage? Good question. Um, implants, when I do a breast implant, I will take your implant as close to the middle as your anatomy will allow. So patients with a very wide gap to start with, which is just skin, there's no way you can bring the implant to the middle because it'll be just skin over the implant and you'll have too much rippling. In patients where their breasts tend to almost touch even before a breast augmentation, then you're definitely not gonna get a gap after surgery. In fact, you've really gotta work hard to avoid a semastia. But if afterwards they're too far apart, then it's potentially possible to bring them closer to the, to the middle if your surgeon hasn't fully released them towards the middle. Usually a breast lift doesn't help bring them together. The breast lift is designed just to bring the nipple up a little bit higher. And if the nipple comes up a little bit higher, then 
um, the overall breast shape has improved, but it doesn't usually breast bring your implants together. Of course, you can have a breast lift in conjunction with breast bringing your implants together, but you've always got to remember that there's a limit to how far that your breast can be brought together. One other option, of course, Amber, if you have too big a gap in the middle and the surgeon, your plastic surgeon, uh, believes that he's made them as close to the middle as he possibly can, one other option is to do some fat grafting. And the fat grafting will give you more cleavage by putting fat between where your implants are um, and therefore give you a more natural look, a, a better cleavage and less of a gap. So um, talk to your plastic surgeon about what are the options. And it's certainly an option if your nipple needs to come up with to do have a breast lift and some fat grafting in the middle. But just be aware that fat grafting uh, sometimes needs to be done more than once as a, anywhere between 20 and 40% of it will disappear. And, um, but it's a, it's a really good way of um, fixing a cleavage that's a little bit wide that can't be made any closer or even fixing some upper pole deficiencies if it, if, if it looks too fake at the top of your breast. So keep that in mind when you're speaking to your plastic surgeon about what other uh, techniques can be used because it's not always implants. In fact, fat grafting is becoming more and more popular around the world as a way of um, just fix correcting secondary problems with breast implants. Uh, it's also good for tuberous breasts and expanding the lower pole of the breast. And it's good for the small asymmetries when your ribs are more prominent on one side. It's even good in conditions where there are a few conditions where you don't even have a pec muscle or you have abnormal ribs and it's good for making, uh, giving you symmetry. In the past, we used to use um, implants, for example, sternal implants, if patients had a very um, pushed in or sunken chest, but these days fat grafting is a lot better in that respect. All right, and We've got time possibly for one more question. Um, there's a question about friends having surgery uh, in Thailand and um, finding out that their size and brands of implants were both different. And how do we make sure this doesn't happen? Well, my view on Thailand surgery is that the problem is, number one, you don't quite know what you're going to get. And number two is that if you have a problem, it's very hard to go back to Thailand and, and have a revision or go back for just an assessment. So it makes it very difficult. In Australia, I'd say if you have a breast augmentation, you have a 98% chance of no problems at all. And my best guess from overseas surgery would be that you might have a 75% chance of no problems at all. So. It's not that you're gonna get necessarily a, a bad result from overseas, but your chances of a good result are much better if you stay um, in Australia with a plastic surgeon. And also it just makes it so much easier for follow-up um, if you need to have something fixed um, or even just for peace of mind. So it, it makes the follow-up a lot easier and you have a better chance of a better result to start with. Also, if you have it done in Brisbane, uh, in Australia, we have breast uh, device registries that keep a close eye on what implants are being used, whereas overseas it's quite common uh, well, those registries aren't being used. So there is no way of telling exactly what implants are in there. And certainly in a Brisbane hospital here, we've had a patient who's had implants taken out that have had not for uh, clinical use stamped on the back of them. So you just don't know what you're gonna get. Um, We've got time for one more question, and um, and that is, so what happens when you have a wide chest gap and then your surgeon brings them close, but then it ends up with symastia? Um, so has, does it normally mean over the section of the chest muscles? There's different causes for symastia, but one, one is over the section, one is too big an implant, one is that sometimes naturally your breasts are very, very close and it's hard to avoid it without having a very small implant. Um, plastic surgeons are pretty good at picking up on this beforehand and advising patients that it might be possible. But unfortunately, if you have symastia, uh, if it's picked up very early, you can wear a, a thong or symastia bra, which holds the implants apart 
and puts pressure on the skin between the, the breasts to try and hold it, hold it down. Uh, but if it's been a period of time and they're joined and the skin is lifted up, then you need a surgical correction. Um, so there's various causes, correction is possible. Very early on, a bra, a, a thong bra or a synastia bra may help, but um, long term, most of the time, it requires surgery. Well, I thank everyone for their attention today. That was a great little session. Um, we might do it again early next year if there's any other questions. Um, and also feel free to email me at any time through the rooms, brisbaneplasticsurgery.com, uh, and um, or come and see me any time. I'm always here. So thanks for everyone very much for their attention today and great questions. Enjoyed every one of them. Made me think a lot. And um, everyone have a great Christmas. Good night.